I've gathered you all here for a special mission. Today, we honor one of Cartoon Network's most ambitious and breakout shows of the early 2000s, handling it with tact and care, codenamed Kids Next Door. With 81 total episodes spanning across six seasons and nearly a decade of production, what happened? Well, we're not there yet. Thomas David Warbutton, better known as his pseudonym, Mr. Warbutton, was born August 31st, 1968. He'd be very interested in cartoons from a young age, but also comic books, anime, and the world of superheroes, particularly the X-Men, of which he considered the candy to be a direct inspiration of, due to the concept of, quote, a collection of different people and different nationalities coming together to fight colorful supervillains. Upon graduating, he attended Cookstown University University, studying graphic design. However, his passion would change, learning that he'd rather be making cartoons. His father would often discourage him from being in assembly work when it comes to manufacturing, and Warbutton would often think about those moments when it came to what he wanted to do. Warbutton would move from Philadelphia to New York City to work at Buzzco Associates Inc., an animation studio that produced animated TV specials, commercials, short films, and the like, for those such as Sesame Street, Nickelodeon, MTV, Schoolhouse Rock, among many others. It's here where he'd begin the process of meeting people that he'd befriend and want to work with in the future. He'd also work on the then-new Nickelodeon series, Doug, with Nickelodeon spearheading a new initiative to have creator-driven shows, let alone original original animated shows, alongside Rugrats and The Ren and Simpy Show, Warbutton would work as an assistant layout artist on the first season of Doug, as well as be an assistant animator to the end credit sequence of the show. In 1985, Sue Rose would doodle a cartoon character that would later go on to be called Fido Dido, named by Joanna Farone. Upon selling the character on t-shirts, PepsiCo would license the character to use for their marketing campaigns, replacing such people as Jeffrey Holder to be their primary mascot. One of the companies involved in creating commercials for the company was an animation and design studio called J.J. Seldemeyer Productions. It was there when Warbun would spend five years working on projects such as being the production designer for the new and controversial show, Beavis and Butthead, but also the director of TV Funhouse, a segment on Saturday Night Live, and also the director on the new at the time episodes of Schoolhouse Rock, an animated series that combined music with education. It was there when Warbun would meet Sue Rose, who had the idea of a young girl going through the trials and tribulations that occurred during adolescence and middle school. I started animating those commercials and I met the creator of Fido, Susan Rose. And we had very similar styles, and she was pitching a show called Pepper Ann. Yes. <laughs> so, Pepper, uh, Pepper Ann looked very much like Fido Vito. And the network said, well, we don't want Fido Vito, we want something different. You should, you should have Tom redo the drawings. So I redid the drawings and then Pepper Ann started to form and then that became a show. Although originally picked up for Nickelodeon, the show would go on Disney Channel slash Toon Disney and would be the first Disney animated television series to be created by a woman. It was then when he'd think to work on his own series that he'd want to pitch the Cartoon Network. Well, if it isn't Chippy, and it's them with a twin brother, Kenny. Welcome to the secret laboratory of Professor Chipper and Kenny and the Chimp, as described on the wiki, reads as so. A boy named Kenny, voiced by Tom Kenny, accompanied by an unintelligent chimpanzee named Chimpy, goes through various situations that often turn unpleasant for him due to either Chimpy's antics or another catalyst. In this pilot, titled Diseasy Does It, features Professor Triple Extra Large, a reoccurring villain within the kids next door. Although a pretty fun plot, Cartoon Network was not too interested in the main concept. However, within this pilot laid the foundation for a pretty important show within Cartoon Network's history. When I started watching Sue make this show Bible, I started to realize, hey, I can do that too. So I started formulating ideas on how to get my own show. So I came up with an idea about a kid named Kenny who has a chimp that's a real pain in the butt. And in that, in that short was 
a group of kids named the Kids Next Door who lived next door to Ken. They were not, they were not a global organization fighting against evil super villains yet. They were just five annoying kids. Cartoon Network was geared more towards the five kids next door rather than the main characters and their antics. In fact, there was a graphic sent around that talked more in depth about said kids. Little is known about this group of five kids that operates out of the house next door to Kenny. This in itself is strange, as no one knows which one lives there, if any. And no one has seen any trace of parent supervision. Depending on the item they could have gotten their hands on that day, they have called themselves the Catapult Kids, the Deep Fryer Five, the Chocolate Pudding Platoon, the Makeover Mafia, the Bucket of Brown Betty Bunch, don't ask, and many other monikers. No name has stuck for very long, more likely just mischievous kids, with access to high-end technology, than criminals, but don't be so sure. They are very secretive of their actions and are not friendly to outsiders, especially Kenny. Upon observing this more, besides the very early design of the main five, this seems to be worked on around 1996 to 1997, based on the copyright information at the bottom. So going through the process of making another pilot, he created what we know today as No P in the Ool, the pilot for codename Kids Next Door. Why are we in the kiddie pool? Because the water's nice and warm? I finished the pilot and then I said, so do I get a series? They said, no, we're making 10 pilots this year and we're gonna let the viewers decide which ones, which ones, which one becomes a, a show. To those who have seen my Rise and Fall of Courage the Cowardly Dog video, you may notice some similarities when it comes to the atmosphere of Cartoon Network. If not, let me give a slight refresher. Cartoon Network began the initiative of producing multiple cartoons under the collective name Cartoon Cartoons, spearheaded by Fred Cyber. Multiple series came to light under the project from Dexter's Lab to Ed and Eddie to the aforementioned Courage the Cowardly Dog. The goal of the series was to drum up interest in new programming due to the fact that at the time, Cartoon Network relied more on its library than new programming. However, unlike Courage, Cartoon Network wanted to determine things via vote. A 2001 Warner Media Archive press release states, viewers becoming programmers during the Big Pick 2 when they determine what new show will be seen on Cartoon Network. One lucky winner will be named Cartoon Network Executive for a Day and program the network with all of their favorite Cartoon Network shows. Warbun recalls that day to be stressful as he was not informed beforehand if his show had won or not, but it did. By a landslide, excited but anxious about working on a new show, he got straight to work on the first season, working at the newly opened Cartoon Network Studios, releasing Kenny and the Chimp and No P in the Ool as part of season one, alongside the exploration of new and exciting stories led by the kids next door. It was set that in December 2002, Cartoon Network would make history, leading the charge on a multi-ethnic group of kids with a mission to combat adult tyranny. This is the rise and fall of Codename Kids Next Next door. In the process of making this Rise and Fall video, I spent a lot of time binging shows with friends. A lot of my friends have recommended anime, and that's what made me get Crunchyroll. It's the largest destination for anime and manga, having one of the most complete libraries of anime, anything from Naruto, Attack on Titan, and One Piece. Which by the way, has anyone ever watched every episode of One Piece? If you did, you're a brave man or you have a lot of time. I picked Crunchyroll because of the fact that I can use it on any device I have, PC, iOS, PlayStation, and there's more, Roku, Android, Xbox, Apple TV, pretty much almost any modern device. I love the fact that it's ad-free, professionally subtitled, hashtag sub not dub, and in 1080p HD, and there's no watermarks getting in the way. I've gotten a lot of recommendations the last time I asked about anime to watch as a newcomer to the scene, and if you have any more, please drop them in the comments below. I've been trying out Shield Hero now. I've only gotten up to episode two as I've been working on this Rise and Fall, but it's very interesting so far. It's about this guy who finds a book in the library talking about these heroes who wield a sword, spear, bow, and shield, of which he obviously makes fun of the shield, but then he's cast into a world due to his inexperience, he's branded as the weakest, and he has to build his way up through betrayal and vengeance to those who have wronged him. If that interests you, or if you have the time to binge during this time in the world, go to crunchyroll.com slash alphaj or click the link in the description and get your 14 day free trial of Crunchyroll Premium now. If you have any suggestions on anime I should watch after Shield Hero, let me know. That's crunchyroll.com slash alpha j. The general process of Kids Next Door starts out with an outline, around 3,000 words, although it depends on the writer. But definitely no scripts, as the creator himself said he does not like scripts. 
at least to start out with. And then each writer would pitch the idea to designers, artists, and other staff, and they'd refine the idea to a point where everyone is roughly satisfied with it. Warbutton would then make an animatic to make sure that everything is accurate to the vision as possible before sending it over to Korea as he stated in an interview with Frederator. What is the core of Kids Next Door? To anyone, you might have a different answer. We would, Kids Next Door is about, uh, kids, we, we like to take kids' problems and blow them way out of proportion. So we, the general idea was come up with you know, a, a one or two sentence idea. Adults are raising the drinking age of soda up to 13. Why would adults want to give uh, kids pink eye to harvest the crust? And what are they doing with the crust? They're making apple cobbler out of it. So you know, we would like to come up with these basic ideas that might work into an episode. Sometimes it's two words, the spinach inquisition. We like the idea of these conquistadors coming and, and forcing kids to eat spinach. Or what if, uh, if kids don't eat, like eating asparagus, what if they're trapped in an ocean of asparagus and a great white asparagus like Jaws is, is, is eating the kids. So we like to, you know, just come up with these big, in quotes, high concept ideas and then write, you know, write the episode around that. The Kids Next Door is a force to fight adult tyranny. In the show, the kids have a general dislike of adult things, a drive to help kids along the way, and a hostility between teens, all of which we go over here. Also, assume if I mention the group Kids Next Door that I'm referring to Sector V, which is the main five characters of the group that we see in the series. While there is a multitude of episodes to pick from when it comes to the hatred of adult things, a good place to start is the relatively early episode, Operation Minigolf. This episode centers around number two and this instant one-sided rivalry with the great Potinsky. While everyone including number two doesn't like minigolf, they play the game anyway and number two wins. However, it was his comments after beating the great Potinsky that really sink in and cause him to go over the deep end, shrinking number two to give an unfair advantage when he'd force a rematch in his mother's basement. Rupert, what are you doing down there? It's time for dinner. Ma! I'm busy destroying my nemesis! Destroy your nemesis later, your pork chops are getting cold! Oh, for the love of God. There's also the episode Operation Piano, where they take a mission to get rid of a truck delivering pianos due to the fact that said instruments were going to be forced on kids via grueling piano lessons. This is one of those episodes that really shines at that kids versus adult aspect. As while their intent is to destroy the pianos, it is only because of their distaste for learning the piano. You don't know what it's like. They make you play the same song over and over again. Ah, it's 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 horrible. Lastly, while not exactly a distrust for an adult thing, Operation Pop deals with adults putting a stop to root beer, raising the legal drinking age to 13, which upsets many kids, including number two. In that episode, the raid is being led by a man named Mr. Fizz, who catches number two selling illegal soda. However, when inspecting Fizz's own operation, things get darker. When the entire crew gets involved to save number two, they learn about Mr. Fizz's factory, that he uses to stuff children into bottles in an attempt to keep them under control so that they won't drink any more soda. I got an idea. Why not take the little rule breakers and throw them in a can? Or should I say, bottle? <laughs> okay, two things. What? You crazy. Although in the episode Mr. Fizz is shown to be a tough villain, they do win in the end, even if it took everything that they had. These three episodes and more introduce that kids versus adult aspect that's a core of the show, and how it's a never ending war between these two for control, power, and freedom. There are episodes that focus more on the aspect of helping kids along the way, as that is part of their creed. One of the first episodes, Operation Ice Cream, deals with rogue ice cream men not wanting to deliver ice cream to children. It also has a very action-packed opening, with the kids next door stealing the van in order to get answers. While the aspect of helping children was focused on more in the beginning and at the end when they finally take down the ice cream monster and just have a party via the stream of ice cream, it is something that they take seriously. Another episode, Operation Caked, one of the first episodes in an episode I talked about, was the first in a saga that dealt with the delightful children from down the lane, a notorious
glorious group of five children who often helped adults, especially father, who will be seen more later, and their plan to initially eat all of the cake themselves, and not share it with any kids, but invite them anyway? Splendid. Now while I eat our birthday cake, you may sing it again. However, one of the more significant episodes that deals with the topic of helping kids is Operation Fountain, a fantastic episode that dives into the topic of eternal youth. One kid given the name Leaky Leona is harassed by the delightful children from down the lane because they feel like she knows the secrets to a certain fountain. After being persuaded, I put that in quotes, she gives them information on how to get there. However, this isn't for the delightful children to use the fountain, but destroy it, believing that all kids must grow up to become adults. Leona would be tied up and forced to age back into the old woman that she was supposed to be, as she needs to stay within close proximity of the fountain to keep her youth. In fact, Leaky Leona isn't exactly a victim in this. So I've relived the fourth grade, moving from homeroom to homeroom over and over again to hide my eternal ten-year-oldness. But it's been worth it to not have to grow up. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for saving me, kids next door. Too bad I have to destroy you now. She turns on the kids next door, the same ones who helped her, and nearly wiped them out by de-aging them until they were nothing. It was one of the first times the delightful children helped the KND, although it was very direct. Even though the fountain is destroyed, they still help Leona, even after she tried to, in a sense, destroy them. While it looked like on the surface that Leona lost her fountain of youth, the end of the episode showed that she had another source. While it is a great area to call this helping children because she is artificially extending her youth, I do think the message here is clear and consistent with all of the other times that they help children. If you think there is no love lost between kids and adults in Kids Next Door, try teens. There's been a big amount of episodes where the teens have sided with the adults and created hostility between themselves and the Kids Next Door. One of the first episodes to show so, the second story of the eighth episode, Operation Point, starts off with a big implication. The candy spy on a road that has a lot of teens driving up a certain mountain, and from what we hear, they're all seeming to hype up a spot called The Point, where you quote, go up a boy but leave a man. However, because they're kids, they think The Point is a factory where teens accelerate the process of turning into adults. There's also a moment in the beginning where they open up a car and it looks like they're grossed out with teens doing whatever. However, it was more about the state of the car, there wasn't any teen in the car. The way this episode is written, The Point reads more as a place to make out or do even more. However, it's not. Look inside. Sure. And once the boss starts kids' night, you guys can skate just like the grown-ups. The episode makes it clear to show that the kids next door were more curious than malicious. How were they supposed to know that it was just a roller skating ring, and not what they thought? Another episode that plays out with that curious state of mind is Operation Support, which focuses heavily on number one and number two's curiosity slash general distrust in adults and teens, but also on number five's illness and number five's sister Kree's training bra. The episode largely plays out like the last one, where number one and two are nosy and eager to know more about things, in this case bras, but not just because of what they are, they believe them to stand for battle ready armor. However, the episode doesn't pull any punches when it comes to making a lot of implications and assumptions on the fact that no one knows how to describe said bra. It's a weapon! Are you crazy? A bra is for... Uh, well... Girls use it with the strap and the... Look, look just go back to the treehouse so I can get some sleep! 
there's a very heavy leaning towards having an action first mindset within these episodes. Many times the episode will start with a big fight or big action moment. Take Operation Chad for example. In that episode it started with the kids next door operatives around the world being taken out by an unknown enemy, raising the stakes within a minute by implying that this mysterious force has taken out every other operative and the kids next door is down to only our main characters. I'm scared! What do we do, number one? Number one? I... I don't know. It's that focus that grab your attention immediately in a lot of episodes that sets Kids Next Door apart. The show had lots of comedy, but there was a clear focus on action with different missions, heists, and fight scenes. There is also a focus on creative concepts, such as Operation Fly, Operation Report, Operation Archive, Operation Food Fight, Operation Love, and Operation Science, labeled art episodes, where they really dive into creative concepts around animation and try to make something different. For example, in Operation Fly, there's absolutely no sound besides the background music. Each character has their own music and reaction to said fly. Number one has a fear of flies, pretending to be a samurai, and tries to get rid of the fly. His music was a Japanese motif. Number two's music was more of a waltz. As he built the contraption to fly alongside the fly, and what the wiki states was an aerial ballet. Number three's theme sounds more like something from a music box, as she wanted to put makeup on the fly and have a tea party with it. Number four's theme was more heavy metal, as he was trying to squash the fly, showing his aggression. Number five's theme was more smooth jazz, being the voice of reason and releasing the fly after some thought and hearing everyone's side. Out. It's a marvelous episode and it serves as a great palette for you to see all of the other art episodes, as they all have their own spin on a unique concept. So now with the general aesthetic out of the way, let's get on to The Rise. Abigail Abby Lincoln is the smart, chill, sometimes sassy, but voice of reason and often second in command of Sector V. Voiced by Cree Summer, who also played Susie in Rugrats slash All Grown Up, and Penny from Inspector Gadget. According to the wiki, she is quote, trained in stealth, information acquisition, and fierce combat. She is the oldest of the group and by far the most level-headed of all the team members, although she isn't above the occasional awkward moments herself. She has a crush on her teammate number two. She's been seen as the second leader quite a bit. In the funny but tense episode Operation Quiet, number five takes it upon herself to make sure that number one gets his sleep. She's very tough on number one due to his need to work all the time and generally serves as that assertive voice, telling him when he needs to relax. In that episode, of course, the opposite happens. And everything that can happen does happen. We have Lizzie calling and demanding a date with Nigel, who is sleeping. Number four takes a bullet for the team and disguises as Nigel after some rough persuasion from number five. We've even had the same girl from Operation Caked, one of the first episodes, sell Girl Scout cookies from her group the Skunky Scouts, of which if you've seen her in the previous episode, you don't want to get her mad, and thus they pay for every single box in fear that if they don't, she will turn into the big battle lesson again and thus wake up number one. There is also the common cold, Sticky Beard, Professor Triple Extra Large, and the Toilet Nader, who wanted to attack for all different reasons. In fact, put a pin in Sticky Beard's reason, wanting the loot for a previous episode, as that will be important later. Of course, with all of that balancing, it bites number five in the butt. Man, that was close. Hey, keep it down, number five. I am trying to get some sleep here. Oh. <laughs> There was also the final episode of season one, Operation Grow Up, where number five took a very active part in encouraging the team to push forward after the horrible attack on number one from the delightful children, aging him until he becomes an adult. Even though number four would also take some leadership post number one voluntarily leaving the kids next door despite never being decommissioned, a process that makes the official status of being in the kids next door no longer valid, it was number five's poignant comments that pushed number one into getting his internal drive back to want to become a kid, interfering in the delightful children from down the lane's fight with the remaining members of Sector V. Ah, brave warriors ye young'uns be, but ye be no match for St 
Sticky Beard, the stickiest pirate ever to sail the summer. As I've mentioned before, number five and Sticky Beard had previous issues before the episode Operation Quiet. The hostility stems from the episode Operation Pirate, a fun episode where the kids next door battle a debuting Captain Sticky Beard and his crew of candy pirates. Within that episode, it focuses on number five's stash of candy, to which he promptly hides when Sticky Beard loots their treehouse for the first time. If it wasn't for the closet door opening exposing her stash, she would have gotten away with it. Due to number five deciding to never let go of her chest of candy, she is thrown aboard the ship and locked away as a prisoner, although initially holding her own and also offered the opportunity of a lifetime to be Captain Sticky Beard's first mate, thus giving her access to so much candy, she denies only wanting her personal box of candy, remaining loyal to the kids next door. There's a lot of fighting that goes on in this episode and it shows how resilient she is. She holds her own against a bunch of pirates and even Sticky Beard himself. In some aspects, she functions as the lone hero of the episode, or at least a majority of it. However, oftentimes she is the voice of reason or the driving force to keep people focused or relaxed when the time is right. Speaking of the crush on number two, it was shown in Operation Date when number one talked about each member needing a date to blend in during a party ran by the delightful children. Both number two and number five were very comfortable with the idea, hinting at the fact that they both have some feelings for each other. Number three and number four also pair up, but we'll get to that. Number five has a family that knows quite a lot about the kids next door. Her sister, Cree Lincoln, named after the voice actor, was formerly a part of the kids next door under the code name number 11. She taught number five everything she knows, according to her, in the episode before Operation Support, she was hinted to be working with father, an upcoming villain at the time. She tried to use a device that went into number five's brain and took secrets from the candy. However, that didn't work out the way that she thought. Suckers took the bait just like I told you. Great plan, number five. Now, return to headquarters. Roger that, number one. She's also very protective of her hat, a well-defined part of her look. It generally conceals her eyes, and she does use it sometimes within combat. In the episode Operation Lice, the delightful children from down the lane replace her hat with one that has lice after number five raids their house for nacho chips. With number five's hat being taken and her hair consumed by giant lice, it affected her as we've rarely if ever seen her without her hat. However, after defeating the monster with nacho chips, no, really. They do get revenge. Wow! You dropped this, youngster. Thank you, adult person. <laughs> An episode that focuses on number five is Operation Flavor. The episode starts out with number five speaking about the three main flavors of ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. The way number five speaks about it in such an enthusiastic tone also makes sense given how much she enjoys hoarding a personal stash of candy. She also speaks about a secret fourth flavor that tastes much better than the other three combined. Poor deluded girl. There's no such thing as a mystical fourth flavor. What do you fools know about ice cream? Just look at yourselves. Putting sprinkles on your ice cream. <laughs> and we thought number four was the dumb one. <laughs> However, after such a strong refusal, number five would be run down and kidnapped to said place where the fourth flavor is rumored to reside. It's a marvelously constructed action sequence, having tons of moments where both number five and the mysterious truck would be on the winning side. However, now being in restraints, forced to enter the lost temple of the fourth flavor, we'd see a moment where one of the workers would try to solve the puzzle, the flavor of the day. And when you give the wrong answer, you are encased with chocolate. The the episode takes a turn by having the delightful children from down the lane be the ones who are behind this invasion. They cleverly hold the fact that this is number five's dream above her head, forcing her to work with them, even though neither side trusts each other. Due to number five's interest in the topic, she gets the answer correct. The flavor of the day is Sunday! 
the glorious moment is met with a chase as number five jets through a small tunnel. An Indiana Jones-esque boulder composed of ice cream rolls down after number five steps on a booby trap tile, causing her to run much faster, buying her time with the now blocked exit. Having both the knowledge of the temple and the specific scoop, number five gets in with ease, guiding her down another corridor that is preceded by four flavors melting. Rushing over to the place that stores the last amount of the four flavor, she is quickly restrained again, leading the delightful children to not only take the last bits of the four flavor, but also have it exclusively shipped for adults to consume, not kids. This not only upsets number five, it also breaks her spirit. Nearly taking a celebratory bite for themselves, they place sprinkles on it, or as they call it, What good is ice cream without Jimmy? However, not heeding number five's warnings, said Jimmy's lead into the ice cream dissolving into thin air, leading the entire cave to collapse. While everyone is quick to retreat, number five is left with a dilemma. Retreat like the others and save her life or risk it all, being one of the last people to experience the taste of the hidden four flavor. Being that this is what she spent her entire, well, young life pleading for, she takes the risk, falling with the cone, trading safety for the possibility to be hit by lightning. Losing her safety and now her hat, she gets close, but tossed away into the rubble. Luckily, she'd survive and also get a tiny taste with the episode building up to what it tastes like, but then pulling back immediately. Ooh wee baby, that stuff tastes just like- Talk to me. Yeah, 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 don't worry. Number five just took a little trip, but she's cool. It's a valiant effort to secure the fourth flavor, and she was rewarded for her resilience, strength, and keeping her cool under enormous amounts of pressure. It's what defines number five's place within Sector V. She is the voice of reason, which makes sense as to why she's often second in command. She goes with the flow, and when times get rough, she can be even more resilient than number one himself. Wallaby Wally Beatles is the blunt, energetic, brash, aggressive member of the group of Australian descent sense. Voiced by D. Bradley Baker who played Klaus in American Dad but also Perry the Platypus in Phineas and Fur. According to the wiki, number four is, quote, the team's combat expert and heavy weapon specialist. Despite the fact that he is the shortest member in Sector V, he shows that he is not someone to be overlooked with his great fighting abilities and unwillingness to give up. Wally is often called the dumbest member, though he has shown a great deal of intelligence in certain situations, suggesting that perhaps he just lacks a little common sense. He wears his aggression in the way that he walks, talks, and makes decisions. In Operation Piano, his aggression and short attention span leads to the mission's detriment. As I spoke on before, the Candy crew were getting rid of pianos to avoid lessons, to which number four would take things into his own hands and open up the back of the truck, leading all of the pianos to fall on him. However, he'd shoot himself in the foot, the foot with the cast on it, so both of them, and ruin a future plan because he felt like being replaced by one of the hamsters was a blow to his credibility. It's that hot-headedness that doesn't always work in his favor. You think he's gonna fall for your fake stories about being injured and hurt to get him to stop paying attention long enough for the rest of the team to climb into the back of the truck and take the last piano he's transporting off to be destroyed? However, it isn't always that major, and more often than not, his anger isn't taken that seriously, and is only interpreted as the way he communicates frustration. In Operation The Shogun, when the famous cheese-based restaurant opens with no cheese, the waiters beat around the bush trying to guide their customers away from ordering anything that has cheese on it. Although the first few times number four willingly obliged, he'd blow up at the waiters, justifiably, when they asked number two if he'd like cheese to go with this cheesecake. I'd like a nice big slice of cheesecake, please. Uh, would you like cheese in the cheesecake? Now just hold on a second, Bob! What kind of cruddy cheese joint is this, anyway? In one of the art episodes, Operation Report, when you focus in on number four's section, it shows his aesthetic and mindset perfectly. In a Dragon Ball-inspired parody of his fight with the Delightful Children, he was shown to be very arrogant but also ready to battle. However, when the Delightful Children would up the ante, the only thing that would change on his end was his hair, showing that while he talks a big game, he comes up short quite often. Huh? Ah, crud. 
Interestingly enough, I want to highlight that while number two generally serves as the pilot or main driver in most missions, in Operation Ice Scream, number four was shown to be a great driver, especially when under pressure. He can definitely be a team player, even during times when it's not exactly served with good intentions. During certain scenes in Operation Fugitive, an episode that primarily dealt with number 86's plan to capture a kid who's trying to escape being decommissioned, number 86 would turn on the boys in Sector V, instructing them to do something as trivial as watching a flower because that's all they were good for, in her opinion. While number one and two would understand that this was out of disrespect, number four would take this seriously, guarding it even when they'd inevitably get involved with the main mission anyway. Ah, one fugitive all wrapped up to go. That's impossible! You idiots caught number 206? And we kept the dandelion safe too! Shut up! However, you can't speak about number 4 without mentioning that he does have a soft side, particularly with number 3. As previously referenced in Operation Date, when number 1 wanted everyone to have a date for the delightful children's party, number 3 and 4 were very quick to pair up, showing a mutual interest. When you combine this interest with this aggression, you have a lot of moments of tension, both with and without number 3 present. In Operation Arctic, a supposed well-respected operative, number 30C, would make passing remarks about number 3, to which number 4 would always promptly change subjects. It's clear in this episode that in addition to not liking number 30C, because he thinks that he's better than him, that this was not helping either. Speaking of, according to Warbun himself, during the storyboard pitch, he was informed that number 30C as a name didn't make sense, because 30 Celsius is quite warm. But he ran with it, saying, of course it didn't work, because number 30C is an imposter. Oh, come on! Even my name! Given it away. However, a more direct and early episode, Operation Cats, tells a clearer picture. The dissonance between number 3's caring and loving and sometimes overbearing nature alongside number 4's tough, cold, and aggressive attitude creates problems between the two, and that is amplified here. Destroying number 3's cat out of anger, this enrages number 3, who has number 4 dress up as said stuffed cat. Although Wally would stay in a bitter mood during it, I do want to highlight a characteristic of the now destroyed cat was to repeat the phrase, I love you, to which number four would repeatedly refuse to do until around the end of the episode. Uh, number three, thanks for saving me and all. <laughs> it's okay. I love you. Press your luck. An episode that focuses on number four would be Operation Movie. Frustrated with the kitty garbage according to him, he exits the movie theater in pursuit of a better movie to watch. Impressed with the movie poster for violence, the movie. He is rejected up front due to his age, leading it to him getting a disguise. that for you. Here you go. Now let's get in there. We don't want to miss a minute, do we? The reason it was an adult-only movie becomes apparent quite quickly. However, the episode does place tiny hints beforehand, having the old man have a familiar voice, and say that this is his first time being here. It is shown that Mr. Boss is leading a meeting upon all of the villains. Fun fact, Warbun in the design department would turn many of the crew into villains due to the fact that they were only a season in and didn't have that many villains to fill up all of the seats. We'd see the ice cream men of before, father, Mr. Wink and Mr. Fib, the Great Potinsky, Mega Mom and Destructo Dad, among many others, gather together to plan a destruction of the entire kids next door. In fact, the very same person who helped Number Four get inside of the movie theater by saving him from exposing his disguise was the Toilinator, a villain who seems to be on the bottom rung, if any rung at all, due to how everyone, including Mr. Boss, treats him. In fact, during the meeting, two important things are mentioned: the fact that all of the villains come together and agree that number four is the dumbest behind his back and the fact that the Toilinator had a great idea according to Mr. Boss which fed the Toilinator's hunger for validation. Exposing his childlike thinking, number four requests to go to the bathroom which doesn't set off red flags but him losing his disguise does. Uh, pardon me. Excuse me. Uh, whoa. Ah, sorry. My, my fault entirely. <gasps> Excuse me. Whoa. Ah. What? 
You never seen a guy going to the bathroom before? It leads into a fight that granted number four does his best to try to escape, but unfortunately gets caught by Big Brother, who oddly is allowed to attend the adult-only movie. Trapped under the grip of Big Brother because of his request for chocolate, he pelts it back at Mr. Boss and Big Brother and makes a valiant effort to escape. A lot of villains get their small time to shine, and it serves as a great reminder of how many unique villains are in the show. Upon thinking that he escaped, he meets up with an enraged Toilinator who gives him a piece of his mind. Oh! You, you jerk! This was the best day of my life! Everyone loved my plan, and I actually thought I'd made a friend! But now my plan is ruined because it turns out my so called friend is my greatest day! Me. His voice acting here is one of my favorite moments of his character and of the season. I can feel the raw anger from the way that number four betrayed him. Number four playing his cards right feeds into Toilinator's need to feel validated, saying that he should be in a movie after his so-called victory, which gives him enough time to start up the film camera, which his toilet paper roll is all stuck in, leading it to him being filmed, for the lack of a better word, and thrown on the big screen. It's in this episode where we see that number four is aggressive but the character underneath is a kid who just has a different sense of fun but is ultimately loyal to his crew and always ready to stand up for himself. Cookie Sanban is the carefree, bubbly, fun-loving but also sometimes aloof medical specialist, hamster's caretaker, and diversionary tactics expert voiced by Lauren Tom who also voiced Connie from King of the Hill but also Gizmo and Jinx from Teen Titans. According to the wiki she is quote the youngest and sweetest member in her sect though she possesses is a very fiery attitude when angered. She can be focused and ready for action when a need arises. In everything related to her, she has been super kind and loving. In the episode Operation Camp, she takes in a baby skunk in which they name Bradley. Alongside number two, they act as the parents for Bradley, which gets in the way of number one's plans. A recurring theme within the KND is that because they are so kids, at the end of the day they may easily get distracted, and sometimes this comes at the expense of number one's plans. The original mission was to invade a camp that is supposedly ran by evil adults, brainwashing children to make billfolds and lanyards. However, now with number four and number five getting involved, they make more efforts to feed and take care of Bradley than to actually do the mission. Even though Bradley has been a huge burden to number one's plans, it does pay off in the end. Oh, who's there? In the season 4 episode Operation Love, another art episode from the series, number 3 stars in a 50s style musical, being the carefree girl who wants to follow her heart and find love anywhere she can. Within the episode, it is shown that the delightful children play the role of the love interest, which number 4 aggressively went against, nearly admitting his feelings for number 3 in front of his family and everyone else's. Luckily, he was the hero in disguise, as the delightful children had a malicious plan to take down the kids next door, plus all of the other kids for awards, strangely enough. Number 3 is depicted to be very into her role of the play, wanting to spread joy and love, which is just an extension of her character. However, it is taken to the next step when she'd assert herself to finish her performance regardless of what chaos is going on. She also wields a dangerous yet adorable 2x4 technology in the form of a robot rabbit named Hippie Hop. In its debut in Operation Turnip, we saw it unsuccessfully defend against threats. In fact, we'd also see it in episodes such as Operation Flush, Operation Future, and Operation It. And each and every time, it'd get crushed. It was a running joke that despite looking like a shinier piece of technology, it wasn't actually a game changer. And speaking of, this may be a subversion to the philosophy that War Button would have rather taken the opposite route of having the technology be based on junk that any kid could find, rather than it looking futuristic. 
In an interview, he'd elaborate, it's all thanks to the executives at Cartoon Network, because at that point, Dexter's laboratory already had those shiny inventions. So I went back to the drawing board and came up with something that I think is even better. It's much more interesting to see what kids would make out of junk, and we have a design team that designs them. At first, we'll do scripts and describe in it, but in a few seasons, we just let the design team come up with something wild. People tend to blame the executives for changing their story, but I think in my case, they have helped me to make it better. She'd also be an avid fan of the plush draw franchise called Rainbow Monkeys. They're mostly popular with girls but also very young children. They're well known within the KD universe and seem to be a pretty big company. Number 5 harbors a lot of Rainbow Monkey items and hoards them in a room of the treehouse. Within the KD universe, there exists a movie among other spin off items and media alongside the fictional franchise. I'm pleased to announce the arrival of a brand new Rainbow Monkey within the hour. In the aptly named Operation Rainbows, number three is recruited by a man named Mr. Mogul and his assistant Simon, based on her abilities to spell out rainbow monkeys. She inadvertently guides them to Rainbow Monkey Island, a tropical island that harbors actual living rainbow monkeys that can turn invisible. If his name wasn't a hint, he captures number three alongside the rainbow monkeys in a roundabout way to find the source of the real rainbow monkeys and sell them. Number three would end up escaping in the end, but that would not be the end of seeing actual rainbow monkeys. They'd also appear in Operation Hugs and Operation Feral. Above all, she is loyal to others. In the episode Operation Office, despite Number 4's repeated attempts to leave the other children as they're being gathered for a rainbow monkey party, Number 3 stops him from abandoning the other kids. Despite being frustrated at the fact that none of them are listening to his very clear and serious threats that if they don't jump down the vent they'll be sent to Pluto, it was Number 3's empathy and how the message was being delivered that helped, as when Number 4 then promised a Rainbow Monkey video game at the bottom of the vents, then everyone wanted to jump down. In fact, number 4 even sacrificed his own escape by pushing number 3 down with the rest of the girls from Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. An episode that focuses on number 3 is the episode Operation Fast Food, an episode in which number 3 is given her birthday wish to do the impossible, lead a mission. Despite the verbal pushback from number 4, number 1 grants her wish, however withholding his intentions of making the mission as easy as possible, due to number 3's tendency to go off track during missions. While she was told to get a kid's meal that has a surprise that goes with it, the true surprise actually comes from Chester, rather than the simple mission. However, unbeknownst to the crew, Chester, the same camp counselor from Operation Camp, sets up shop to take children and use them as burgers to feed a growing market of sharks, which the wiki describes as, quote, possibly the most gruesome operation of any villain in the entire series. Upset at the fact that it appears that number three can't even buy a kid's meal without slacking off, number four vents his feelings on the matter. Slowly starting to realize that this restaurant is new and out of the ordinary, they realize that number 3 was hauled off in a kid's meal to sharks. And on a side note, the shark family was very entertaining. I like the fact that it was served as a very cliche dynamic of the always arguing parents and hyperactive kid who wants to eat his McDonald's now rather than when they get home. The kids next door use the casual vehicle to hunt down number three and the shark family. Although number one seems confident that number three's resourcefulness and resilience will pull through, number four thinks she couldn't fight her way out of a cardboard box, the same one that the sharks have. The father shark, very grumpy, expresses it via road rage, aggressively taking control of the road regardless of other people's safety and time. Number five tries to harpoon the car to take back the box, however it was unfortunately to no avail, as the car does go back in the sea, and all that's left is a box with a large bite mark on it. Oh, it's a big one, but I got it! <laughs>
all is lost when they realize that there's nothing more that they can do. However, plot twist, number three was never in the box at all, and escaped before she could be used as burger meat. Attacking Chester head on, she successfully defends herself, pushing Chester into the same machine that she was pushed into. Leaving the place, we see the rest of Sector V blindly raiding the restaurant. However, upon learning that number three was okay, they celebrate, crowding around her as she claims this was, quote, the super funnest birthday mission ever. Number three may be careless and aloof at times, but her well-natured, fun-loving, loyal, and passion to spread love and joy make her one of the nicest characters within the whole show. Hogarth P. Gilligan Jr., or Hoagie, better known as number two, is the goofy, quirky, high-flying, techie, primary 2x4 technologist and pilot for Sector V, voiced by Benjamin Diskin, who voices Eugene from Hey Arnold, as well as Stitch from Stitch. According to the wiki, number two is, quote, a brilliant, friendly, and witty oddball, born in the USA. He is often the mood maker of the group, but is also notorious among his peers for saying incredibly cheesy catchphrases that he alone finds funny. A round boy, he is actually only mildly known for eating a lot. In the episode Operation No Power, everything that can go wrong does go wrong in the Sector V treehouse. Number three would end up giving every single hamster in the treehouse a vacation for, quote, all of their hard work. The problem is that said hamsters power the tree's central power core, which is stated to be the largest power source in the world. Now that their defense grid is down, the delightful children from down the lane hire Grandma Stuffum to attack the kids next door after, well, rejecting the Toilinator. Although Grandma Stuffum puts up a tough fight, number two would not use his tech power, but his gluttonous ability to eat everything that Grandma Stuffum puts in front of him. His attempt was almost effective, however, even he cannot out-eat Stuffum. However, the day would be saved by the hamsters who come back from their vacation rather early and eat the rest. <laughs> <laughs> We're having hamsters for dessert? Hamsters? Don't be so silly. I made the gorilla pie. Hamsters! In the previously mentioned Operation The Shogun, number two is very excited to go alongside number four to this famous cheese restaurant. Within the same episode that number four is being aggressive in, we see number two proclaimed to be a cheese connoisseur and always has a wedge of Swiss cheese with them. This makes sense when it comes to the continuity as earlier within the series, there was the episode Operation Lice, where he'd also have his fair share of cheese-related puns. <laughs> something cool first like say cheese punk or cheese to meet you wait 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 wait! how about this one cheese however getting back to that episode number two would fight for the cheese that the ninjas stole leading up to a big off-camera fight with the cheese made warrior titled cheese shogun rogue for it was hinted at that the fight wasn't as action-packed as the episode made it out to be however so tell me how did you beat the Shogun? Aw, uh, it was easy. He hit his head on the ceiling when he jumped up in the air, didn't he? Well, yeah. Admittedly, his enjoyment of food isn't a big focus, as it's more on two things, being the tech guy and being goofy. Number two was the main pilot in Operation Fast Food, driving under extreme conditions to try to rescue what he and others thought was number three in a cardboard box, as stated before. In Operation Piano, he was the pilot holding the plane at a consistent speed with the truck so that the other members of Sector V could destroy each piano using a contraption that is rigged to the plane. In Operation Fugue, he would pilot due to the orders of a very grumpy and boy-hating number 86. In Operation Camp, due to the fact that he is the de facto co-parent of a skunk that number 3 found, despite the flight being moderately rocky, he was shown to pilot the vehicle with his foot while feeding his skunk baby. Steady! Number 2! Can't you fly this thing straight? Okay, sorry, you tried flying while feeding a baby and see how easy it is. However, there were times where this was subverted. One great example that comes to mind is in the previously talked about Operation No Power, where you'd think that number two's tech skills would come in handy, even with the power outage. His best effort was just a rubber band, which number one called him out for. A rubber band food flinger? Are you kidding me? Our super amazing treehouse, supreme center of our 2x4 technology, is home to an inexhaustible power supply. And all you can think to make is a big rubber band? 
Come on. It was also shown in the season six episode Operation Amish that number two loves technology so much that he begged number one not to leave him. Number two would also be highly critical of the way that Sector A, aka the Amish kids next door, would be opposed to what they called, quote, lazy machines. He's also super goofy and punny. And no, I did not mispronounce that. In addition to the previous pun in Operation Lice and all of the other cheesy puns made in Operation The Shogun, he'd also goof around in Operation Brief, a very weird episode that has number one be the victim of an evil pair of underwear hired by the delightful children. However, before he is seen as sentient, number two spares no feelings to make fun of number one and his rear end. Granted, everyone else did as well, but this wouldn't be the only time. There's also Operation But, where essentially it's more of those jokes, those same jokes happen just without a rogue pair of briefs, but an actual photo of number one's, well, but. Thanks guys. You aren't still gonna quit, are ya? Negative number four, I don't have to now that I've got these back. Those are the negatives? Yeah! How can such a huge, juicy fit on that teeny <laughs> piece of film? Guys, now come on, Nigel's had a big day. Not as big as his butt! <laughs> He's known number one for the longest before the kids next door, being friends since kindergarten. He's also never been second in command, even though his name is number two, and when offered, he turned it down in Operation Feral. He's also known Wally way before the kids next door, showing that he was a big factor in the early history of Sector V and thus the kids next door. However, he's also a factor in the future. His brother, Tommy, has expressed interest in joining the kids next door, looking up to his brother very much. Although showing mixed messages in Operation Tommy, he'd backstab the candy in a roundabout plan to get more time with Hoagie, because then he wouldn't be spending it with the candy, he'd be spending it with Tommy. For context within this episode, the common cold, a villain that surrounds the illness, pesters Sector V, and the situation would have been properly handled if it wasn't for Tommy getting in the way of the candy's plans. He told me to make new friends, so I made friends with the common cold, and he came up with this cool deal I make a cool machine for him, and he gets rid of the kids next door for me. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. Within that same episode, his mom was known for her secret weapon that would stop the common cold, showing that number two comes from a very combat first family. What's even more surprising is in the episode Operation Tapioca. It was shown that his grandmother was a part of the Senior Citizen Squad, a collective that came together to fight the kids next door. Although they are villains and don't particularly like the candy, they use their powers for their own means. And in this episode instance, it was to take a truck full of tapioca pudding. It was shown that number two's grandmother named Lydia Gilligan would use anti-aging cream, which would wear off very quickly to disguise herself and have more energy to fight back. However, speaking of aging, one of the better episodes to show number two in the best light would be Operation Kiss. In that episode, number two would invent a machine that gave hamsters a hundred times their strength. He'd be working on this hard in the cold rainy night eating a chili cheese dog, which seems to be one of his favorite foods to snack on. With test hamster running away, number two would accidentally test the machine himself, turning into a teenager to which the candy, minus number two obviously, would handle promptly. It does seem a little strange that they don't find any similarities with the eyes and outfit or casual way that he spoke, but regardless, he gets defenestrated and left to rot in the rain until a fellow teenager spots him. All right, talk. Who are you and <gasps> where'd you get those Balls. Cree, number five's older sister, and Hoagie, now going by the name Hank, would set up a date, but multiple times during this date, he'd need to go back and reapply the de ageify ray onto himself. He'd also learned throughout the process that he'd need to have whatever ingredients are in a chili cheese dog inside of him for the process to work. Each and every time, the kids next door would dispose of the teenager, never thinking about the fact that it's the same teen and number two hasn't been seen anywhere. I guess they were too wrapped up with whatever's on TV. It's here, where you're probably asking if number two has a crush on Kree, does number five know? The answer is yes, but they don't talk about it from what I recall. We do see a different side of Kree though. As in episodes such as Operation Support, Kree would be a lot more confrontive. She's not only developed a crush on Hank, but also unintentionally gives number two his first kiss and trusts him with her bra. No, not that one, the battle ready armor. As because of one too many hamster slash de-age raid trials, the power for the Sector V treehouse goes out, and this provides the perfect opening for Kree to attack the kids next door. Their defense grid is down. You know what to do. I'm 
really sorry, Hank. But I gotta go. Mind you, this was a continuation of the distant guidance of Kree led by Father, who at this point we see very little of, but it builds off of the previous episode, Operation Support. She'd put up a great fight, taking out almost everyone until number two snaps out of it, weighing his loyalty to the kids next door above Kree's love and exposing his main secret. You see, Kree, I also have a secret. Number two may be goofy, annoying with his puns, and sometimes an oddball, but he also has tons of moments of being intelligent and is an invaluable member of the team due to his knowledge on piloting and 2x4 technology. Nigel Uno is the confident, workaholic, serious to the point of being stubborn and bald team leader and primary strategist also voiced by Benjamin Diskin. According to the wiki, he is a stern but awkward boy from England. He is often encouraged to lighten up but is seen as a source of inspiration for his comrades. He has an uncanny knack for landing himself into embarrassing situations. He is rarely seen without his sunglasses, and is most curiously bald, apparently was caused by the delightful children at some point in the past before joining the KND. Speaking of the origins of Nigel being bald, when asked about that aspect in an interview, the creator talked about there being a live action possibility with the kids next door, where he'd want to tell that story, but for now, he's sitting on it. The whole baldness aspect does come up in Operation Fountain, where number 5 would speak about the last time she slacked off in rescuing a kid. That kid was number 1, whom the delightful children from down the lane made bald. The last time number 5 didn't help someone kidnapped by the delightful children, he did something she can't ever yeah. forgive! What? What did they do that was so bad? They made me bald. Aside from that, Nigel is a strong leader and generally is in command of most missions within the kids next door. Sometimes that would work against them like in Operation Cowgirl, where upon being saved by an adult fighting ally named Lasso Lass, he'd not be impressed with the way that she ran her base in the way that she was a leader despite every other member in Sector V being okay with everything. In fact, there was a pretty funny moment where Lasso Lass would hold up a tin can phone and depict it as part of her equipment. Hello? Can you read me? Hello? Would you like to accept a collect call from the 21st century? <laughs> Speaking of Lasso Lass, she would explain that she is a part of the Cowboy Kids Club, apparently being the last member. This show would remain vague about the affiliation with the KND. The main antagonist of the episode, Mr. Wink and Mr. Fib, was originally in the Cowboy Kids Club, but would split when Six Shooting Timmy, at the time when he was named that, lost his hair and his chances of being with Lasso Lass. Number one would be too stubborn to realize the interlocking issues here because he was much more concerned with the fact that his team was impressed with such primitive hardware. However, in other episodes such as Operation T, he would serve to be the ideal leader in that situation. His leadership is very tough and assertive, as he is a workaholic that wants everything done on time to the appropriate specifications. However, it'd also be educational. Within this episode, he'd instruct the KND to think and operate differently as they are on the enemy turf. <laughs> The dentist's office. Careful, team. We're on his turf now. Spread out and find the maniac. Nigel's mental strength isn't that hard to break, after all, he's still a kid. There's been multiple times where he's flat out quit or had the wrong information going into the situation. For example, of the former, we have Operation Grow Up, a 22 minute special in which Nigel is hit with an ageify cigar that turns him into a grown up. He decides to quit the kids next door despite no one decommissioning him. He acts on the principle of fighting against adults as kids and also defending against kids if he were an adult. It shows his loyalty, but also his heart headiness, at least to Sector V. Within that, he'd have to fight through his own emotional troubles to actually stand up and fight against the delightful children, who aged him up in the first place. It'd also be the same episode in which we'd meet Father. Bravo, Mr. Uno. You skillfully managed to outwit a bunch of children. The question is, do you have what it takes to play with the big boys? 
He'd also leave the team for a very justifiable reason in the episode Operation But This would also tie into his workaholic nature, but number five would push number one to spend time alone at the beach to relax. This would always create friction between the two as number one would always want to work, but number five understands the value in taking breaks. A crab camera bot takes a photo of Nigel's rear end, and since it was led and created by the delightful children, they threaten to release the photos everywhere unless Nigel not only quits, but becomes delightful ties, which they don't explain, but I can infer means that the process would turn Nigel into one of the delightful children. His team would save him, however they would also crack jokes against their leader, with Nigel not being too happy about the whole situation. Is that Nigel's honey? Wow. That is one big butt. Oh, let me see. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> He'd also be known for his relationship with Lizzie. It'd come up in the aptly titled Operation Lizzie, where tired of Nigel's reaction towards their public relationship, she'd use a boyfriend helmet on him. It's the first episode in which we see Lizzie, and it's the only episode in which he appears to be an antagonist. In fairness, Nigel is disingenuous with the crew when he doesn't tell them about his date, but telling them that he'd be gone on a mission that he can take care of on his own, that's not going to leave a good impression on Lizzie. She'd often be angry at his behavior and him being flustered and embarrassed to be caught in public with Lizzie. And this episode sets the mood to that. You can't say we're going out when we're alone and then deny it in front of your friends. I never did that. You just did! However, there'd be times where her appearance would be used in a more positive way. In the episode Operation Caked 2, after number one finds out that Lizzie would rather take bribes from the delightful kids to double cross him, number one goes on a lengthy rant about how disappointed he is in her, speaking about the fact that he thought that they had a really good relationship going. Lizzie would take this to heart and come back in a fiery way. You forgot one thing, delightful dogs! My crazy girlfriend! What? An episode that focuses on number one would be Operation Oompa, a very heartwarming and down-to-earth episode of the series. It starts off with number one trying to escape into space only to fall into his dad's truck. Fun fact, he is the first one to have his parents shown within the series so far. His father, as wholesome as he is, wants to take his son fishing, and number one wouldn't be too thrilled with the news, preferring to go on missions with his friends. Nigel would be as unsupportive as he could be, up to and including pushing his head within the water and holding his breath. Ouch. He'd even make a large fuss about the fact that his father is playing the sousaphone live, embarrassing him in front of all of his friends. I do enjoy the fact that all of the other dads seem to enjoy the music. I also like the design of number one's dad. To me, I perceive him to be very old-fashioned and humble, wanting to pass down those values into his son. While number one knows a lot when it comes to leading complex missions, it is humility that he'd struggle with the most. I'd like to request we get out of this stupid boat with your stupid fishing Drunk at your stupid tuba! Actually, it's uh, Susan. Who cares? I want to hang out with my friends. They don't wake me up at five in the morning because they read some stupid article in the stupid paper! Although seeing it more out of frustration than hate, it leaves number one with a lot of guilt, seeing his dad get fished himself. His dad merely wanted to have that same friendly relationship with his son that his son has with his friends and wanted to bond in the way that he thought he could. With all of the dads being fished up and the sound of a Susan phone, number one would go investigate. He'd see that his father was actually okay just playing with the boy who just so happens to be the main antagonist. Willard Wallace, a very spoiled, entitled, and round kid who fishes up other people's fathers when he needs attention. After Nigel's father would want to return to his actual son, not this weird kid calling him dad all the time, Willard would get aggressive, hanging him over some sharp, deadly rocks very high in the sky. Nigel would have to fight for his dad and show that he actually cares and loves him. Of course, to show his love and loyalty to his father in the best way possible, he'd have to compete in a sousaphone battle. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
It is here where the episode gets very fun-loving. The sousaphone battle is very creative, and it's similar to the concept of dueling banjos, something that Warbun would say really inspired him to make this episode. His father, while captured and tied at the ankles, would enjoy the fight. Number one, while not perfect, would play decently well against the kid, but it was an uphill battle, and a losing one. His father, not really disappointed, would merely comment that he is glad that Nigel tried his best. However... Well, Lord, is it really you? Uh, yeah. Oh, Yes, he actually has a father, and his father just goes away for a short while, but to him, because he requires a lot of attention and is quite entitled, amplifies the time gone and goes to worst case scenarios. His dad, happy that he played the sousaphone once, would comment that his skills need sharpening up. Number one is a workaholic and can be pretty stubborn, but he rarely backs down from a fight and is very loyal to his team, which is why he makes for the perfect leader of Sector V. With all of my Rise and Fall videos, I tend to give a very broad overview of the show, because there's only so much you can do before the video is hours long. And in some cases, it still is, even with more to talk about. The vast amount of villains in the KND warrants its own dedicated video to the topic, so consider this an appetizer. I'd like to go over four villains that really compelled me. Administer spankings to those naughty children that deserve them. Perhaps they've toilet papered someone's house. <laughs> then I am summoned to apply my powerful palm to their posterior. This is Count Spankulot, a vampire whose primary goal is to spank naughty children. His mission is to serve justice, just in his own way. He's a thin vampire who wears a medallion, giant cape, and gray suit. He first appears within the episode Operation Cannon. Albeit a short appearance, his role within the episode was to show how unorganized and vulnerable the group is without Number One. He rushes in and spanks the rest of Sector V, as Number One is away on a mission. He claims it's due to overdue library books, but is never confirmed within the episode. Do not pay their library fines shall incur the stingy wrath of Count Spankulot! <laughs> However, a much better representation of Count Spankulot as a villain would be his appearance in Operation Spank. Get this spank happy vampire out of my courtroom! I am sorry! I would never ever give an unwarranted spank! No! No! Within this episode, you can show that he's very passionate about the very weird line of work that he's devoted his time to. Unfortunately, tragedy would strike when the Count punished the wrong kid, and was dragged away for spanking an innocent child. While Count is a villain slash antagonist within the show, he is more of a chaotic good slash neutral, in a sense that he did feel extreme remorse for going after the wrong child. It seems like he's not motivated by greed or even the pursuit of power, but that justice is served. He proves so by making an alliance with the kids next door within the episode, vowing to protect the innocent children from adult tyranny. Fun fact, within this episode, he is shown to bend giant pieces of metal at a whim, as he does so with Mr. Wink and Mr. Fib's giant robot with ease. They find that he is much more trouble than he's worth, making a plan to repeat his initial tragedy, by tricking him into speaking the judge, thinking that it was Mr. Wink and Mr. Fib up to no good, again. However, because of one of the KD operatives, number three, deciding to reveal their plans, he is furious and vows revenge. I thought you said that we sent Count Spankula to the judge's house on purpose so we could get rid of him. And then just like when we tricked him into spanking that kid Carlos before. <laughs> He'd get revenge on the KND in Operation Lockdown, hypnotizing number one, two, three, and four. He'd also show the ability to make rainbow monkeys spank happy vampires, which is crazy. So in addition to the telekinetic powers, teleporting, flight, you can also add hypnosis and illusions. However, he does have a few weaknesses, garlic and sunlight. The former shows up very briefly within the episode Operation Munchies. I've got the box. I've got the box. I've got the box. Garlic. Oh, yeah. And the latter shows up in Operation Lockdown. Oh. 
Tankula is very interesting because of his alignment of being good, even if it goes against the KND, but still an adult and thus a villain according to how he frames it. Welcome to the world of Mr. Boss, a clearly corrupt and corporate businessman who is often portrayed as a major villain within the series. Sporting no hair on his head but definitely around his ears, a mustache, and always having a cigar in his mouth, his stance on children is clear. He doesn't like most kids. He'd first appear within the episode Operation Office, where he'd serve as the main antagonist. When it's Take Your Daughter to Work Day, as I mentioned in the number 3 segment, Mr. Boss plans on sending all of the girls to Pluto, presumably doing the same with the upcoming Take Your Son to Work Day. Hey, stop, you little brat! Uh, you're fired! Yo, stop! His plan would go awry when number 3, number 4, and all of the daughters would interfere, raining down from a vent that connected the ship to the building, and said two members of the KND would save the day. In the episode Operation Movie, he'd host the villain Gather Up, where all of them would come together to suggest ideas involving the destruction of the kids next door, possibly knowing that a lot of children would be next door watching the Rainbow Monkey movie. However, they didn't know that number 4 would sneak in disguise, not knowing that the quote, adult only violent act action movie would be a cover up. He doesn't play a giant role within this episode beyond just showing his influence, but he seems to be well connected with most of the other villains, showing that he has power. He also shows a clear dislike towards the Toilinator. A few times within this episode, he shows that he doesn't want his help, however his big opportunity would come within this episode. Unfortunately, since number 4 was listening the whole time, the plans went awry. You, you jerk! This was the best day of my life! Everyone loved my plan, and I actually thought I'd made a friend! But now my plan is ruined, because it turns out my so-called friend is my greatest enemy! Speaking of the relationship between the Toilinator and Mr. Boss, there's the episode Operation Flush. It dives into the aspect deeper. While Operation Movie focused more on number 4, foiling the plans and his trials and tribulations and having a different type of fun, this episode focuses more on the Toilinator and his admiration to be beside Mr. Boss. To him, he sees Mr. Boss as the cream of the crop when it comes to adults, so he tries very hard to get into his inner circle. What generally prevents him is his lack of competence, which is interesting because when he focuses, he can be just as, if not more powerful than any adult villain. But it's rare, and it needs to be fueled by an inner rage. We'd see the Toilinator take his need to impress Mr. Boss into his own hands, ambushing one of their plans in the end. I thought we were in trouble for a second there. <laughs> oh, you're in more trouble than you know. Number one? What are you talking about? I'm Mr. Boss. Oh, hey there, Mr. Boss. What are you guys doing here? Hey, wait a second! However, one of the best episodes to feature Mr. Boss would have to be Operation Daddy. In that episode, number 85 is given a disastrous haircut, in which number one would rescue number 85's brother, Shawnee, who is freaking out about his haircut. Taking Sector W, not V, Sector W with him, number one would go through a lot of trouble to find out that it was Mr. Boss who gave the haircut. A battle would ensue before number 86 would walk in, revealing to number one, as well as the audience, that she is the daughter of Mr. Boss, to which Mr. Boss says something incredibly insightful. Hey, it's okay if you're in the stupid kids next door. You're still my little fanny pants. <laughs> Sure! And I'll tell you what, you and your friends keep battling adult tyranny, and me and my friends will keep trying to make other kids' lives miserable. <laughs> no, not if the kids next door stops you first, Daddy! <laughs> <laughs> That's my girl! That revelation led to number one, Sector W, and us, the viewer, to know that Mr. Boss, while corrupt, child-hating, and greedy, cares about his own kids, and is just like any other clumsy dad. While this doesn't redeem him, it shows that there is layers to his character. The delightful children from down the lane are five children with a mission to destroy the kids next door. They appear more than every other villain and have proven to be bent on taking down Sector V. They speak in synchronization, behave properly, 
are later to appear to have gone through a process called delightfulization and not only wish to become adults but also help adults out in the process. While I could take any episode to show this, I want to censor in on the caked saga. This was an episodic format in which the delightful children would refuse to share their birthday cake with other children, often shoving it in their faces. In Operation Caked, they have a birthday party protected by the big adolescent. The candy interrupt the party but fear her wrath, and thus have to figure out another way to share the cake. Unfortunately for both sides, neither party would get the cake, it would only be eaten by the big adolescent as shown earlier. Things would heat up in Operation Cake 2. Within this episode, the delightful children would create multiple decoys to stop the kids next door from truly knowing their location. Part of their plan was to bribe Lizzie, Nigel, aka Number One's at the time girlfriend, to take part in diverting the kids next door. Number One would take this to heart in a pretty brutal rant, which would fuel the fire in Lizzie to right her wrongs. Looks like really good frosting, Nigel. I, I can't believe you, of all people, would do this to me. I thought we had, I don't know, a special relationship or something. Oh, Nigel, you're so sorry! In Operation Cake 3, you probably already get the drill, the delightful children would brag about their cake but not share. The spin on this episode is an unlikely duo, or in this case, a mass partnership, due to the fact that number two's Eggapult would require eggs, because they plan to use those in order to sabotage the delightful children. All of these eggs stay in number one's room leading them to develop a bond with Nigel. Like in Operation Camp, number one is inconvenienced with a pet that he didn't ask for. Not that his team is helping in any way. However, it's pretty much like that episode where in the end, said undesired pet would help number one in a major way. Taking down the delightful children, but not leaving with the cake. Every year we go through the same thing with you brats refusing to share even one bite of your delicious cake. So that's why this year... This year, we're going to let you eat the whole cake all by yourselves. In Operation Caked 4, the pursuit of cake revolves around an event, the annual Tubathon, a race that all kids go through. In this instance, the prize is said cake. When the delightful children show up to have a trick up their sleeve, number one would use their own cheating advantages against them. The episode would also revolve around number two and his tube that would always get in last place. In fact, at the end, he'd sacrifice his victory to save the other kids, who often got caught up in father's underhanded tactic to use said tube and kids in his cake batter. Why would I build a skate park for you infernal children? I've been building a pan for the largest birthday cake ever! All for my delightful children. And all I need to finish my deliciously evil recipe is some water and a full serving of bratty children. <laughs> the fifth episode in this saga, you guessed it, Operation Caked 5, revolves around the debut of number 19th century, a KD operative revived, also accompanied by the chief archaeologist for the kids next door, number 50 million BC, whose sexist ways clashed with number 86's ironically sexist ways, which led to them developing feelings for each other. It's definitely the weirdest episode in the saga for sure, and I can never do it justice within a segment. This leads into the KD finding out about the delightful children's cake in outer space, led by Father, who plots to destroy all of the ice cream in the universe. Apparently, he wanted the delightful children to be the last people ever to experience ice cream, which connects with Operation Flavor. The ingredients are one fudgy marshmallow truffle, huh? No, the recipe's smudgifying. Please, no, no. In the sixth episode, surprisingly not titled Operation Caked 6, but simply Operation 6, this episode follows structurally like Operation Pop in having number two on the run for delivering soda. Number two would get a request from Mary Beth March, a kid who only wants one thing for their birthday, soda. His nemesis, Mr. Fizz, would give number two to chase, as number three and Bradley, said skunk from Operation Camp, who would later be commissioned as number six, would tag along. However, with the skill and luck that number two, three, and six had, they'd be faced with an extra problem. Due to having no breaks, they blow past the kids next door blockade. 
leading them into the big twist. There was no soda. There was a party, however. The party didn't need soda, but cake, as it was a delightful children's party. I am sorry, Hoagie, but I love cake, and they said that if I helped them, I could have a slice. Thank you so much for delivering our birthday cake, Hoagie. <gasps> Knowing you got it past the kids next door roadblock will make it taste all the sweeter. As you can tell, the delightful children rarely do fighting themselves, and there's a lot more than just these episodes to show, but they have proven to be a formidable enemy and an entertaining quintet that has left a legacy within the series. Father, the main villain of the kids next door. Sporting a suit-like appearance and voiced by Maurice LaMarche, it was determined early in the show that this guy would be the real deal. Being the father of the secondary antagonist of the series The Delightful Children from Down the Lane, he has the same mission, destroy the kids next door so that adults can rule the world unopposed. In the beginning, it's shown that father would send out other villains to do his work, like Cree and The Delightful Children. For examples of the former, go back to Operation Support and Operation Kiss, where father would be a guiding hand for Cree and her her battle to take down the kids next door. In fact, towards the end of Operation Kiss, we'd see that she'd get arrested and taken aboard a ship to the kids next door moon base. This is Cree to Mission Control. They're taking me directly to the moon base. Excellent. Everything is going according to plan. However, getting past the cameos, he'd be seen in Operation Grow Up for the first time. Upon appearing, the delightful children show fear towards him. This would be the same children who'd put lice in number five's hair or hire hit grandmothers to feed Sector V to death, make number one bald, bribe number one's girlfriend to divert Sector V, bribe other kids to instill paranoia within the kids next door, and try to destroy them in front of their families, and that's just the beginning. For them to show fear in father's presence shows the power of father and the power that he wields in the background. In Operation Grow Up, he'd fight back against number one, not letting him age back down, fighting him as he is. Although a tough battle for both sides, it'd be shown that father, while being able to control fire in an angry fashion, can't resist the cool blast of ice cream or really anything cold. <laughs> Chill out, old man. Cold. So Cold. And me. Father! Me. My. Sweater. It's also one of the rare times the delightful children stood in fear of the kids next door for successfully defeating Father. He'd used telekinesis in a previously mentioned Operation Caked 5, the fifth episode of the Cake Saga, in which Father wanted the delightful children to eat the last ice cream in the universe. He'd used shapeshifting in multiple episodes, including Operation Training and Operation Graduates. He'd even used shapeshifting in Operation It. Well, it was simple, really. When that dumb number two kid opened the door, he reached out and tagged me, just like this. Tag, you're in. Lore-wise, while Father is the primary villain within Kids Next Door as a show, he doesn't show up for a lot of episodes. And some episodes focus on the delightful children and how they think of Father rather than the main plot of Father vs. the Sector V slash Kids Next Door. For example, in Operation Party, as you'd expect, Cree doesn't exactly plan a mission to destroy the Kids Next Door in Father's house when the delightful children invite her and her friends over. Now I know I can trust my delightful children to keep things neat and tidy while I'm gone. Right? Of course, Father. Good. I left some money on the counter for pizza. And don't forget to feed the cat! They'd lean on the kids next door to help, and it isn't exactly the same as the other father-centric episodes. However, I would be leaving a huge chunk of father's character out if I didn't talk about the biggest special to come out of the kids next door. Operation Zero. The sky is amid a gross green as the environment surrounding it creates an unpleasant atmosphere fueled off the backs of child labor. Children of all ages appear to be dragging sacks of ingredients and working around the clock non-stop in a warehouse and it doesn't seem to be the only one in the world. In this dystopian society, the children have lost their free will and seem to be under a higher rule. It is then when we see one brave boy and a lesser brave soul rush into a room with a tree. V 
the only thing that seems to be healthy for Miles. The brave boy speaks out about slaving away making tapioca for his father who just so happens to be the ruler of the world. His brother seems less willing to slack off and just wants to get back to work as quick as possible. It is then when they find a secret compartment of the treehouse which leads them into a room that holds a book. This book would be the lost book of the kids next door, an instruction manual on how to fight adult tyranny with a page for each kid to tell their story. However, before they get too far in, their father is aware of their disappearance, looking for them. Together we can do this! I know we can! What do you say? The brave boy would take deep personal offense to this, seeing his brother turn away from him and succumb to the fear of their father who would keep them imprisoned, enslaved, and miserable. It hurts the brave boy, but he decides to fight anyway. It's that bravery that would increase the legacy of what he'd be known for, being number zero. It's here when we see that not only does the young number zero free his peers, but he also stands up to his father, who looks very familiar. This is a great hint of what's to come, and shows that if this is his father, then how does father play a role in this? He takes down his father, and ever since that day, it was the dawn of the seventh age of the kids next door. Some people think the story I just told was a myth that children talk about in passing but isn't true, but number one thinks it is true and will stop at nothing to prove so. As you can tell, seeing that the beginning was narrated by number one, this special would focus on him heavily and his workaholic act first, stink later mindset, which will come into play later. Number one would often get entangled with number 101's fanboy attitude and memorabilia hoarding mentality, but nonetheless respect his work and his workplace. The kids next door are seriously cool museum of artifacts and stuff. He'd talk about the different artifacts within the museum, but focus on the recommissioning rate, a device that could restore the memory of any former kid next door operative, even if it were wiped out by the decommissioning ray. It'd be just then when every villain that was immortalized in wax and much more would come out of the shadows, initiating a large scale ambush on the museum. It'd be just then when number 86 would come on the intercom and request help from Sector V, but for another emergency. Super one, get your lazy butt up to the moon base right now! Sorry number 86, no time for another one of your silly ice cream deliveries. I've got a real emergency to deal with. Silly? I am giving you a direct order now! While number one in Sector V would take care of the museum fighting off tons of villains, the moon base would be under attack by a galactic Captain Sticky Beard. Although number 362, the supreme leader of the Kids Next Door organization, would throw every other sector at Captain Sticky Beard, it'd be only when Sector V would appear that they'd rescue what is left of the treehouse in a salty victory. Literally. Despite saving both the museum and the moon base, number 362 would reprimand number one's failure to follow orders, an impulsive need to do what he thinks is the best strategy regardless of the team, and considers it a disrespect to her authority. She would mention that the attack on the museum was just a diversion version tactic and the actual attack was on the moon base to which number one would think the higher priority was the museum due to the fact that it holds the inspiration of number zero something that inspires him a lot. While number 362 would think of it as a myth, number one strongly believes in the story. However, they were soon to learn that the attack on the moon base was a diversion. The actual artifact that was sought after was a decommissioning ray in the museum. Number one going without his team this time would go after it, knowing the power that it wields. It's at this evil convention where father would reveal his own father, a man who used to have enormous power, ruled the world, and was defeated by what he would describe Describe as a misguided boy with this dumb book. With the recommissioning ray, father can restore this man to his former glory. However, it come at a cost. Villains, revengefully, I make this solemn pledge. This time, I will not let a child get the better of me. I shall transform each and every snuff-nosed brat on this planet into ancient, ageified senior city zombies. I shall ageify everyone who has ever been a kid. Wait a second. 
I used to be a kid! Me too! Who ain't been double crossed? Yes, grandfather would wage war on all children, but also everyone who ever was a child, and in this case, all of the villains gathered up in a neat convention just for him. It should be noted that both number one and father would go into a depression over this event for different reasons. Father clearly wanted validation for recommissioning his grandfather after having his memory wiped, ruling alongside him. However, grandfather tossed him aside, claiming that he only gave him his memory back because he couldn't take down the kids next door himself, deflating father's ego and making him a shell of his former self. Considering that at this point, with the exception of Mr. Boss sometimes, father has been the leader at the top of the ladder when it comes to adult tyranny, so to have the chair kicked out from under him so easily proves the power of grandfather. Number one would be depressed because it was his impulsiveness that backfired on him. If he never showed up, father would never have the power to recommission the recommissioning ray. It was number one who doomed children from all over the world. We'd see children from all over send out all of the defenses that they can, but with every defeat, the enemy grows stronger, and with each treehouse down, a tapioca factory pops up in its place. Two thirds of the kids next door would fall under grandfather's rule. Right behind this door, but this is my house. Son, what are you doing home so soon? I thought you'd be playing with your kids next hood or whatever it is. Uh, what is it you children say? Oh, well, never do it. In addition to helping his dad escape the senior citizens that wants to convert both of them, there's a part I would be remiss not to acknowledge. Back in the moon base, number 362 ordered number 3 and 4 to gather parts to create a non-ageifying suit called birthday suits that make anyone who wears it remain the same age. However, in the midst of being invaded, both were caught, but not after number 3 and number 4 kissed for the first time, cementing the feelings that they had for each other, albeit number 3 was a senior citizen at the time, but they would do it again when they were both senior citizens. Upon finding out about a secret hatch in his house, number 1 would try to recommissioning Ray on his father to learn that he is truly number 0. It's then when he'd question if this is the little boy in the myth, then who's the other boy? Father. This makes father number one's uncle. Have to help them. But, but father, that's, that's our arch enemy, Nigel Uno. Silence! It's my fault for reawakening grandfather. Fine, he's evil, which I admire. Right? Yes, father. Good, then we help Uncle Monty. Yes, father. Right after hey! we blast these K and doofuses! Blast this! This also makes the delightful children the Lost Sector Z, bringing everything together in the lore. We'd also learned that the delightfulization process that made Sector Z, the delightful children from down the lane, is a process that can't be reversed permanently by the recommissioning ray. Unfortunately, they would only be free as Sector Z temporarily. We'd also see that for a rare time, the delightful children would not listen to Father, pushing him aside and attempting to attack number one after direct orders not to. It seems like there is an impulsive need to destroy kids and while this doesn't make the delightful children morally in the right, it does make their actions out of their control in the grand scheme because of the process, the delightfulization process. While father and number one's dad, also called Monty Uno, confront their father, grandfather once more puts down father, admiring Monty more. While this would make father upset, he'd ultimately be too defeated to fight back. Unfortunately for him, the entire plan is to divert attention enough so that number one can drive the moon base directly into grandfather in an atomic explosion. This plan would have some complications when number one would be confronted by his crew, who have been converted into senior citizens. <laughs> This would be an incredibly rare time to see what was the delightful children alongside number one battle the rest of Sector Z. It was an amazing fight. While they'd fight off the senior citizens of Sector V for a short while, their recommissioning would wear off, turning them back into the delightful children who want nothing more than to destroy the KND and don't have any higher thinking to realize how this would hurt them in the long run. Lost and defeated, number one would see the birthday suits in just enough of a good condition to kind of save his team. 
the half-converted Sector V would manually create enough horsepower to drive the moon base directly into Grandfather, and news that everyone would have predicted, Grandfather somehow survives, but was in the perfect place to be decommissioned again. I broke it. I had a hunch you might want to use it to get number zero back. Well, look, I would love to have tons more adventures with the super cool number one and his team, but I'm just not a kid anymore. I'm an adult, and I need to complete the most important mission of my life, being a good father to my son. A proud but sad number one would understand that number zero must stay in the time period he's in, and he'd find a newfound appreciation for his father. One month later, the moon base would be rebuilt, bigger and better than ever. Number one would be widely known as the son of number zero. Number 362 would offer a promotion to number one that he'd decline, preferring to stay with his team. And number one would be in possession of the Book of KND, immortalizing his legacy and grand victory of saving the kids next door under five words. We are kids next door, with the fantastic special going over well with the fans. What happened to the show? Well, we'll discuss some aspects when we get into The Fall. The fall of the show can be non-existent to many fans. It's completely understandable to believe that with such a great legacy that the show would seem flawless or that the flaws would be minimally affecting the overall quality of the show. Since like with the rise, this is a subjective part of the video, like with many of the other videos in the rise and fall series, take of this what you will. What's the, what's the most difficult project you've ever worked on? Well, the one I'm working on now, Kids Next Door, because it's it's kind of, you know, it, it all comes back to me. I, you know, I'm the bottleneck where there's this massive amount of work to be done. You know, we did six seasons, two specials, a movie, and that's a lot of stories to come up with. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot of, and, you know, a lot of people, we had generally 50 people in the studio, 50 people outside, uh, you know, everyone in Korea. And, re and I did a lot of the writing, and really, like, that was just, you know, Kids Next Door is, is we'd like to try and make each episode like this big cinematic movie and to come up with a big cinematic movie every week was really grueling. With the show that goes on for as long as Kids Next Door did, you face a lot of challenges. There are relentless deadlines that you must keep, enormous pressure to deliver the quality for you to continue your passion, and the fear of writer's block putting a roadblock on progress. Kids Next Door is an amazing show, but it isn't any different. But, uh, you know, the way I deal with it is I don't have a choice. <laughs> I, have to, I have to sit down and, you know, if I don't come up with a show, uh, a show idea, Cartoon Network fires me. <laughs> so, so, really, you know, it's, it's kind of a lame excuse, but somehow, somehow they come. And that doesn't mean all of them that, that come out are awesome. Right. There's certain ones which I, I, you know, certain stories I look at and I'm like, wow, we really had to whip that one out. And other times, this story you just whipped out turns out being one of your best ones. Right. You know, it, it's, it's all part of the process and evolution. With even the creators speaking about the fact that sometimes you have to stick to deadlines which may be at the expense of creativity, you end up being in situations where you'd have to force an episode out that you might have otherwise taken a little more time on. Being a showrunner is a tough job. By knowing all of the factors that go on in the background, you and your work is judged off of what the public knows, which oftentimes isn't usually the problems that you run into when producing a show. While I think that no season was bad in the Kids Next Door series, there are a few episodes that just seem to exist and fill up the season without adding any new value or any way for it to stand out on its own. Some may say this is just the nature of putting out a body of work, and I do agree. Uh, my old head writer, Mel Willems, when, when he was asked how he, uh, you know, how he came up with his ideas, he said, I have a mortgage. Um, <laughs> you don't really have a choice. With that, I can confidently say there are a handful of episodes that did not age well, and I'd even say are pretty mediocre or bad episodes. Operation Chad is one of those episodes. It's an interesting episode for using the first action first aesthetic really well. Like I mentioned earlier, I enjoy the fact that we start the episode with multiple sectors being taken out by an unknown force. 
it adds to the mysterious aspect of the show. We also get to see the debut of number 274, or Chad Dixon, who is actually a very important operative within the KND. However, even he couldn't carry this episode. The episode feels like we're watching someone else watch an action movie with a lot of the action and implied emotion happening off camera or shoved towards the end. I don't see Mega Mom and Destructo Dad as compelling villains sensibly, and their intentions aren't engaging or make that much sense. Spoiler alert, but the seemingly invincible Mega Mom and Destructo Dad are the parents of number 274, and only destroyed all of the other kids next door operatives so that their son can be number one. This is so embarrassing. Do you know what you just did? So with all the other kids stupefied, now you're number one. No! Even as parents, this makes no sense because Chad is supposed to be seen as good and logically this would have backfired on him. Now you would raise the point that they're supposed to be seen as aloof parents that only want the best for their son and to that I say, not so fast. They are intelligent enough to know how to create robot suits, they are also well aware of the kids next door which shows that they can be major villains, as they were also seen in a movie theater in Operation Movie. And they are aware of number 274's status to know that there is a hierarchy that he has not reached. They know all of that, but they don't know that taking out everyone else ruins the point of an organization? It's ironic that the sister episode to Operation Tommy has the exact same intent from a little boy. And it works better with Tommy because Tommy is a child who's supposed to have that short-term thinking. I made a video a while back speaking on if I would reboot The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. My decision at the time is no and it has not changed for the same reasons why I would have said no before to The Kids Next Door. There are so many episodes produced for the show that the fear of bumping into each other and creating worse versions of great episodes grows greater with each season. You've seen this happen in shows like The Simpsons, Family Guy, and Spongebob where earlier versions are often seen as better because of the original charm that the show has had. Like I mentioned in my Rise and Fall of Regular Show video, these shows are seen as great, but the charm is usually found within the first or second season, and things generally get better or worse as they go on. For Regular Show, things got better, but for Danny Phantom, things got worse. Luckily, Kids Next Door did not have a season riddled with problematic episodes and a lack of good writing coasting off the name value, a la a Fairly Out Parents or Late Regular Show. And with that, there was a need to end the show sooner than later. Six seasons is more than enough for the most hungry fan. You have tons of lore, multiple movies and specials, and video games that would take months to really digest and understand. Simply put, the kids next door needed to end to preserve the amazing legacy that it has. That's just my opinion. And with that, we are left with the final episode, Operation Treaty, which isn't considered to be the last episode in the lore. The premise is rather episodic. Nigel is framed for trying to help the teenager sabotage the KND Peace Treaty. And it's a standard episode, quality-wise. However, January 21st, 2008, Cartoon Network would air Operation Interviews, which is generally seen as a finale. When asked about if Warbutton would consider this to be a finale, he said it wasn't necessarily meant to be the end, so a revival can happen in the future. Originally, while working with the creator of Billy and Mandy, Maxwell Adams, they came up with the story about giant pants-eating ants that according to Warbutton, Cartoon Network rejected outright. Here's how said creator would describe working on Operation Interviews. So how can we come up with a story jai huge enough to wrap up six seasons? How about a car carrier for cruise ships? How about a worldwide scavenger hunt? How about almost every character that's ever been on the show making an appearance? How about the final big giant huge reveal of the galactic kids next door? And a big, fat, sloppy, weepy goodbye. The finale has so much that happens in it, it must be given its own video for justice. In the Cliff Notes version, we are introduced to the Galactic Kids Next Door, the first and final appearance within the show, so far. It's also an episode that follows the Caked Saga with the delightful children. As the KND, namely number 1 and number 74.239, would find the cake, it'd all be a plan to tell number 1 big news, that he'd be the only one who would be joining the Galactic Kids Next Door. Only one kid per planet may join the ranks. It's very selective, but prestigious. The trade-off, however, was that he couldn't go back home ever. Everyone would get their goodbyes. Even if we never see each other again, just promise me one thing, that you'll never grow up, even if you're a hundred years old and don't remember a thing about our times together, 
you'll still be a kid at heart, okay? So who's with me? Five, four, three, two, one! Kids next door! Goodbye. And off he went. He returned later in a special, by the time of the interview. It would be appropriate to leave you all with the creator's last words when speaking about the end of the show. Then there were the end credits. We decided we wanted to show a frame from each and every episode in those last 30 seconds. That's over 150 frames we had to pull, and when I say we mean post-production Potinate, Oren Confer, and Aerial Editor Dave Quarter. And it's harder than it sounds. Each frame had to be immediately and totally read as the episode it was representing, since it was only going to be on for a couple of seconds. But I still wanted to leave everyone with one final image, something that summed up what Codename Kids Next Door was all about. I thought about it for a long time, and I doodled a lot of ideas in my sketchbooks. And eventually, it came to me. Stay young. I'm proud of that. Just like I'm proud of my five kids. My kids next door. Nigel Uno, what have you done? The Galactic Kids Next Door would be the next project in the timeline. It's revealed in the prologue trailer that the Galactic Kids Next Door seem to operate as a corrupt, adult-hating organization, seeing anyone over the age of 13 in the entire universe as someone who needs to be destroyed. It leads to new challenges, new characters, and a completely different feel. The animatic style pitch would go on to have a great reception, showing a different Nigel and what appears to be a very authoritarian higher up hierarchy system. Warbutton would pitch this to Cartoon Network, but they were not interested. For what reasons, we don't know. Maybe this isn't the right time. Maybe it doesn't fit in with their vision. Maybe they don't think it'll prove to be profitable. Either way, this darker series gathered tons of fans, including D. Bradley Baker and Warbutton himself to sign the petition. Warbutton would write a blog post talking about the incident, Sitting at the very end, sorry to say that sadly there isn't interest in doing more KD at the moment. Knowing that it was a long shot, it crushed him just because of the fact that he had to tell his fans, who were excited at this new idea that it will remain as so, just an idea. But you can change that. If you want the Galactic Kids Next Door off the ground, it's in your hands. Share the animatic, get a hashtag trending, tag the creator in fan art, show your love for the original series as well, stream the original show anywhere that it could be seen, and maybe, just maybe, with your help, you can stop the Galactic Kids Next Door. Until then, thank you for watching. Special thanks to Toon Grin, Tudor, The Amazing Gap, and Draws for helping out with this video. It would not have been possible without these guys, so please thank them in the comments below. Special thanks to the supporters of August, and until next time, take care. Alpha out. <laughs>